At some point, you've likely had a conversation with your friends and your family when you get ready to put your house on the market. Some of those conversations probably went brilliantly and they said, hey, it was a great time selling a house. And others might have said, hey, you know what? There were a lot of challenges. The buyer just wanted more and more and more. They put together a really awful offer. Given our situation and circumstance, we took it and it just was painful. Well, let's talk about when it's time to walk away from a house negotiation for you, the home seller. My name is Andrew Finney and my passion is helping you make sense of real estate. If you need help finding a top agent near you or if you simply want to drop me a line to say hello, my contact info is below. If you're new here, please go ahead and subscribe to this channel now and like this video. Thank you. All right, my friend, to better illustrate this point, think back to a time in your life where you were trying to give your best and you were doing your best to help out another person. But that other person just for some reason just wanted to take, 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 take and take some more. It wasn't getting any better and you knew it wasn't getting any better, but you kept giving and giving and giving. Ultimately, what did that do to you? Was the other person stressed out or was it you that was stressed out? That's why we need to have this conversation today because just like there's points in time that a buyer should probably walk away from a house negotiation, so is true for a home seller. There is a point in time that it might be time to call it quits and find yourself a new buyer that will be more delightful to work with. The best practice here is if you're experiencing frustrations and concerns is to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with your trusted real estate advisor. Find out what options that you have, air your concerns, ask them what the best counsel is moving forward, and they'll give you some things to consider and also weigh the pros and the cons of the decision-making process that's in your hands to make sure that you're making the right decision for you. Now, depending on the market conditions, sometimes that you could have another offer lined up and ready to go, or it could take a long time and it might take months to get that offer. So that's where weighing these pros and cons and airing your concerns with your trusted real estate advisor really is going to be to your benefit. To further illustrate this, let's take a closer look at six signals that could be red flags and your sign to get out of Dodge. The first one is that the buyers are asking for way too many concessions. Now, when we think about concessions from your point of view, the home seller, what are we talking about? We all know that everything in real estate is negotiable from the price to asking for home repairs to asking for home warranties and also contributions from you towards their buyer closing costs. But what about if they start saying, hey, you know what? I know that we've already agreed to you paying 1% of my buyer closing costs. Uh, we're about a week in now and I would like to renegotiate that with you. I want you to pay now. 2% and I hope you're okay with that otherwise I'm just gonna back out and walk away and you're like well given the market condition you might be thinking to yourself this is pretty foul and funky why didn't we have this conversation up front when we were in our negotiation phase before we went the contract well this stuff does happen sometimes where buyers get this crazy idea that they can renegotiate a contract whenever they're actually in contract now this makes it really frustrating and I'm sure that you'd be thinking as I would be thinking and many other trusted real estate advisor what is a buyer agent doing over there to try to explain the process to their clients and properly educate them onto what they can and cannot ask for when you move into the escrow process. It leaves a lot to be wondered about on that. So that being said, what about if it's an upfront negotiation? Let's say that you've been on the market for like three months and this is your first offer on the table and the buyers say, hey, they've been on the market for 75, 90 days. I think I can get them down on this price and I'm going to ask for 5% price reduction right off the top. And let's say your list price is like 500,000. So 5% price reduction off the top at 475 and then they come in and say hey by the way I want you to pay 3% towards my buyer closing costs which is another $15,000 on top of that a total concession from your point of view the seller of $40,000 but the buyer's not done yet with these concessions now they say hey I want a thousand dollar home warranty and anything even the cosmetic stuff in the home repair I want fixed okay when you start getting into those kind of demands, this is where I want you to think back to that situation in your life where you kept trying to do the right thing, you were being agreeable, you were being fair, and you were being compassionate, and then the other person just kept taking, taking, and taking some more. In this case, would you really want to be working with that buyer? The pro and con here is the reality of your situation. Ultimately, the best time to sell or buy a home is when it's right for you in your life. If you have the option and you could stay in your home and you're like, hey, you know what, if it sells, fantastic, but realistically, if it took me another three or four months to sell my house, I'm okay with that too, depending on the market conditions. If you're in a hot seller's market, probably not gonna take nearly that long. Now, if you're in a slow buyer's market and the buyers are out there and they're asking for all these concessions that become the norm of the market, maybe you wanna wait until you get back into a stabilized market or perhaps 
perhaps the seller's market itself. Ultimately, the timing of all of this really depends on your life and what's going on in your personal situation. There are some times that negotiations are gonna go beautifully for you, and there's some times that you're gonna have to be very flexible in the negotiations, I'm just being honest with you. And then there's other times that it's gonna feel like from a buying side, the buyer's like, oh my God, the sellers all keep getting what they want. It's called a seller's market. So whenever you get into these different market conditions, this is where you face down these realities. All the same, if a buyer's asking for so many different concessions, it makes one wonder what else will they be asking for in the closing process. The second signal that it might be time to walk away is the buyer is lowballing you during the offer process and they keep countering with a lower and lower price. Going back into saying that your home is worth 500,000, if they started off the negotiation saying, hey, we'll give you 475, you might be thinking, hey, you know what? That's kind of our bottom. At the same time, I wonder if we could just meet in the middle of this at 487 and a half thousand dollars and put everything together. Well, let's say that you have that conversation with your trusted real estate advisor, you fire off a counter offer saying, hey, we're happy to work with you at 487 and a half thousand dollars. Buyer comes back and says, hey, you know what? I'm now I'm gonna offer you $465,000. So you see that there is no negotiability there on behalf of the buyer. So what do you do as a home seller in this type of a situation? Well, you wanna keep clear on three different points. The first one is you wanna keep your emotions in check, hashtag JTAB, just take a breath to reassess, figure out the overall situation, where's the buyer's angle, where's the buyer's motivation, why the heck do they wanna make an offer on your house to begin with? This is a very real question. Just like as a buyer, it's good to understand your motivation as a seller as to why you're selling. It's also good to know why is the buyer so motivated to buy your house? Is it the sweetest house on the block? Is it just something that's right for their life? Or is it something that they're looking at from a flipping standpoint, right? It's important to take stock of that buyer's motivation. All the same, the only way we can do this with a level head and clarity is to simply just take a breath, to reassess and come up with a logical thought process moving forward, removing the emotions out of it. I know it's easier said than done. However, you will thank yourself after you take that breath. The second thing that you wanna remember is the reason why you're selling. Now here in Las Vegas, Nevada, in practice, I always suggest whether it's a buyer or a seller to write down why it's important to you. In your case of being a seller, write down why Selling your home is important to you. Carry that with you, post it somewhere that's always with you, carry it in your briefcase, carry it in your purse, whatever the situation may be, and remember why you're selling your house. So as you take that breath and in your reassessment part of that, then remember with perfect clarity why you're selling your house and what's most important to you and how the sale of this home fits into your overall life picture. The third thing to remember is that the devil's in the details in a real estate contract. What does that mean? That means that there is so much more negotiation power than simply the price alone. You could then go into a counter offer phase where you say, hey, look, if I sell you this house at $475,000, here's the deal. You're going to now agree to buy the house in as is condition. I will make no repairs except for what I have to do pursuant to your lending program, like an FHA VA conventional loan for health and safety standards. So that being said, devil's in the details, right? Because now if there's work to be done in your house and you're like thinking, hey, you know, there's actually probably $5,000 of stuff that should be done in my house. Now you're going to be able to start adding back to your bottom line. They say, hey, I want a home warranty. Say, hey, again, at $475,000, you are agreeing to buy this house in as is condition. I'm not giving you home warranty. So, I mean, there's so many different negotiation powers here. And you could say, hey, you asked me for 3% of buyer closing costs. That was $15,000. Not going to do that either. So then you can look at your total price with the numbers that we just used and you'd be closer to your list price from a value point of your estimated net seller's proceeds from the sale of your property. When you start refining these details, these devils in these details in a real estate contract, on paper, on the bottom line, on the numbers, right? There is so much clarity that, that you could be had right there by understanding these different negotiations and these different opportunities available to you. Real estate is so much more than a simple list price. Those devils are in the details and those devils can add up to thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars, depending on the price of your home. So keep that in mind. Review that option with your trusted real estate advisor. Figure out the situation. And at the end of the day, go back to point two and remember why you're selling. Because point number four that I'm going to throw on here as a best practice is, hey, if you're absolutely okay with not selling your house to this buyer, then walk away right there. Just say, hey, you know what? I'm just not going to work with this person and I'm done because it's unreasonable. If that's the case, look, 
Do what you feel is right. Do what you feel is best for you and your family. You need to make a well-informed decision that's best and right for you. So if it doesn't feel right, it's usually not gonna get any better. Think about that as you make your decision of what you wanna do here. The third signal is a really big one. What happens if the buyer doesn't put up the earnest money deposit the right way? Or what happens if something isn't making sense with their loan pre-approval letter? Or in the case of a cash transaction, they didn't provide the proof of the funds correctly. There are so many different things whenever you look at why homes fall out of contract. About a third of all the time will be because of financing or cash issues, essentially the way that somebody's gonna use the means to purchase your home. So this becomes really, really important to understand because it always baffles me whenever a buyer wants to go out and look at property without having a loan pre-approval. And perhaps what's more disturbing to me is any real estate agent, realtor, trusted real estate advisor, whatever they wanna call themselves, I don't understand for the life of me, why would you get in the car? Why would you meet somebody at a property if they can't buy that house? How do you know that you're even shopping in the right price range? And what happens if that buyer falls in love with that property only to realize they can't afford it and then they back out and get so discouraged they never buy a home? What happens then? Did you do anyone a solid service as a buyer representative at that point? No. When we're talking about this from the selling perspective, what does this mean to you? What happens if somebody goes into your home and they had this conversation with the buyer agent and they said, hey, you know what? Um, my financials won't be a problem. I will uh, go through the loan pre-approval process once I find the right house, which is a common refrain of some different buyers that I've heard, they're like, okay, uh, I, I'm really a hungry agent and I'm trying to do my best I can and I'm going to go show you this home. And then they say, the buyer says to the agent, hey, you know what? I really want this home. This is the right place for me and my family. I want to make an offer. Agent gets so excited to go and make an offer and they don't even have the loan pre-approval. They may have nothing more than a loan pre-qualification letter. And a pre-qualification letter, frankly, you can go ahead and add it to your toilet roll in your toilet the next time you do a number two because it's a do that will not ever happen for you. It's like I do not let this happen to you with a loan pre-qualification letter. Depending on your trusted real estate advisor that you hired as your listing agent, they should be verifying this information by talking to that loan officer. Now, some loan officers can play a good game here. Some buyers can play a good game and some buyer agents can play a good game. Although same, you got to verify and ensure that the lender did their J-O-B by verifying the income, assets, credit, and employment situation of the prospective buyer. If that stuff does not check out, please seriously reconsider consider accepting that offer until it does. Maybe it's a situation you want to work with them and perhaps you say, hey, you know what, go ahead and work on your financial side of the house and if everything checks out, then hey, yeah, we can accept your offer. At the same time, I'm going to leave my house on the market while you're going through that process in case it doesn't because I need to move forward in my life. Anybody that's reasonable here will understand that and appreciate your position and everybody will get in sync because you as a seller need to make sure that they can buy your house when they put it up. In the case of cash and proof of funds, there are so many different ways to get proof of funds. But what I would share with you is to please make sure that they're verified proof of funds before you take your house off the market. If you want to accept that offer, great. And you can let them know and say, hey, you know, talk to your trusted real estate advisor. Say to them to have the buyer agent get with the buyer, put up the proof of funds correctly that can be verified, that can be sourced prior to you taking your home off the market. If the buyer flakes and gets wishy-washy and they say, hey, I'm not doing any of that. I don't, I, I feel insulted by it. Cool back out, you know, back out of the negotiation process because if you really have it, why wouldn't you show it? Think about that for a moment, let it sink in and make the right decision for you. The fourth thing that a buyer can do that is really disturbing is they start threatening to walk away from the sell at large more than once, more than twice, more than three times. At some point, that's like saying, hey, I really liked your house, I made an offer, we agreed on terms, but now if you don't give me what I want, I'm just gonna walk away. I'm just gonna walk away, I, I, I don't care. Well, here's the thing, depending on where you are in that contract phase, depending on what contingencies may be in that contract, that buyer is also gonna have consequences for their actions, depending on the reasons why and the contingencies that may or may not be in place, going back to devils in the details in a real estate contract, why they could get an out, why they could walk away and get their earnest money deposit back. Same thing is true for you. What contingencies obligations do you have as a seller inside of your uh, agreed upon contract that you need to perform to and that gives you right to back away and keep the buyer's earnest money deposit in such a case? But here's the thing. If you have a buyer that's saying, I'm going to walk away, I'm going to walk away, I'm going to walk away. Okay, cool. You know what? There's the door. Walk away and please do so we're done. Just be honest with it. Because if you're going to get threatened like that, that's not cool. Then no more than it's cool for a buyer to have a sell on the other side say, oh, no, 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 I'm not fixing that. No, no, I'm not agreeing to that. No, 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 not going to happen. A real estate negotiation, like any other negotiation, is one of being open, honest, 
having clarity, and treating each other with kindness and compassion. We are always stronger together than we are not as people. Keeping that in mind that we are all people, we are all human, we all have our own goals, all of our own ambitions, each of us have our own story. Keeping then that in mind and keeping it in perspective as well, during your negotiation process, during your closing process is critically important. Think about how that person would want to be treated. Think about how you would want to be treated. Normally, whether you're going off the golden rule, treat other people as you'd want to be treated, or the platinum rule, treat others as they would treat themselves, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, there's gonna be a commonality of respect and dignity. Having respectful and dignified negotiations will help alleviate these problems. If you're not getting that and you have somebody threatening to walk away, okay. You know, depending on your situation, whether you really have to sell your house because of the market condition, or otherwise you may not get another offer for several months, hey, you know what, it's up to you. And that's where having that clarity and remembering why you're selling is important to you is critically important to make sure you're very clear on it and it forms the foundation of your listing strategy and forms the foundation of your closing process and negotiation process moving forward. Please be clear on why you're selling. At the same time, it is not cool to have a buyer keep threatening to walk away because that makes me wonder through a closing process as much as there is to get done, how many more times are they gonna to try to incite anxiety into the process when it doesn't need to be drama filled? It doesn't have to go there. It might be time for you to walk away. The fifth thing is that the appraisal came in too low and if they can't come up the mountain. They won't budge on the appraised value. Now this is something that I'd like to be extremely real about to you as a seller, is a buyer cannot get more home loan than their appraised value. If they're buying a $500,000 home and they're putting 10% down on a conventional loan, that's $50,000. If that appraisal comes in at $475,000, the polite, correct, and right thing to do is actually for you to reduce your price to the appraised value because, hey, you just got the best deal possible in the market. Now, that being said, some sellers are like, no, I want my 500. I want the buyer to come out of pocket the additional 25K. I want you to think about something. Would you have the money on hand right now to do the same? If so, freaking rock on. You're in a better place than most people are in the United States and you've earned your success and I know it's been well earned and well deserved for you. All the same, whenever you're really thinking about a negotiation and you're really looking at it, even if people have the means in real estate practice and I've seen people that have the means, unless it's a hot and heavy seller's market and the house is just that right for them, I don't see a lot of people coughing up $25,000 above an appraised value. So. I mean, I'm, this is just an example, but it's completely real. So it just depends on you. Now, if it's truly a low appraisal, your trusted real estate advisor thinks it's a low appraisal, the loan officer even thinks it is a low appraisal, then here's the thing. Why not request a new appraisal and see if they accept that? If not, then depending on this market conditions, whether you're seller's market, buyer's market, or stabilized market, it might be time to call it quits. The sixth thing is what happens if the buyer keeps insisting about early occupancy. Now, there is such a thing whenever you're selling a home as having a post-possession agreement, which means that you're going to close on the home first and then you're going to move out at a later point in time that was previously negotiated. In real estate practice, I always share with people to have this negotiation part of the upfront negotiation so everyone is clear on the outcome, on the process, moving forward to closing and it keeps everybody happy because if you agree to it up front, there isn't a problem. But if you start interjecting these additional terms into the closing process, we have a problem. Well, on the flip side of this, there's something called buyer's early occupancy. Now, why would a buyer ask for early occupancy? Well, they could have been selling a home to buy yours and they might need to get out of their house to be able to get into yours. Well, depending on whether your home is vacant when you're selling it or whether you're living there, this could be more or less negotiable. But if they keep insisting, they keep insisting, and they've been difficult up to this point, it becomes one of those really nerve wracking situations that you really need to review in either case, whether they're the best buyers in the world or the worst buyers in the world, you need, really need to review your options with your trusted real estate advisor. Now here in Las Vegas, Nevada, there's a form called a post-possession agreement and also an early occupancy agreement in the case of a buyer moving in early. It essentially specifies terms and responsibilities of both parties, and it puts everything into writing in a contractual format that once signed by all parties becomes a legally binding part of the contract. The reason I'm bringing this up is if it's one of those sidebar arrangements or something, I would highly advise and suggest against that. What I would share with you is to review your options with your trusted real estate advisor and make sure that you're using the appropriate documentation for your location to keep everybody open and honest and upfront with the terms and the expectations moving forward. Doing so will not only protect the buyer, but more importantly here, 
is you, the seller, and your property called your house that you're getting ready to sell to ensure no damage comes to it without the buyer being on the hook if you grant them early occupancy. Something to think about, something to consider. So at the end of the day, when you are thinking about, is it time for me to walk away? Please do go back to what we went into very early on in our conversation today and consider the reasons why you're selling, your market conditions, and how this impacts your life moving forward. So now let's take a closer look at negotiating a buyer's repair request and common repairs a seller must fix after a home inspection. Looking forward to your next conversation. We'll see you in a few.